Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our April 2018 uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, first, a uh, couple of uh, announcements. Uh, there were two uh, kudos, both from Children's Hospital, uh, one for Boris Kovalenko. I don't know if Boris is here this morning. Oh, there he is. And then one for Ryan Stansel. You all know Boris is an R3 and Ryan is an R1. And uh, Boris's uh, thank you note was, uh, is titled just from the staff at SCH, uh, who said he's been uh, very uh, receptive and helpful when Page to ask uh, to help with uh, patient or family issues. And uh, Ryan's compliment was from Sudan Hurd, who's a PACU nurse at Children's. And it's along the la same lines, uh, just stating that Dr. Stansel uh, is always uh, willing to help uh, and that he is uh, very pleasant uh, when asked to do so. So thank you. I have uh, one other announcement before uh, Grand Rounds. Hot off the presses uh, is that the spine match came out today and none other than Dr. Kak is gonna be doing his fellowship at Harborview. So congratulations. <laughs> and rumor has it that one of his friends uh, from residency will also be uh, joining him in that fellowship. Uh, this morning we're gonna hear about cervical disc arthroplasty by Dr. Haitao Zhu. Uh, and Dr. Koch. I think everybody knows Haitao uh, is a former uh, spine uh, fellow who we were fortunate enough to uh, have stay on with us and we hope he's going to be here for many years. Uh, he's been uh, doing a great job in his first uh, two years here. And uh, you all know Dr. Koch as one of your fellow R4 residents. Thank you, Dr. Chansky. <clears throat> um, before I get started, I'd like to thank Dr. Branser and Dr. Bella Barba, as well as Dr. Dr. Joe for their mentorship and help with this uh, presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Hagen because, uh, because of this presentation, I have not entirely prepared for today's cases. So thank you for understanding. <clears throat> um, <She's too> soft. <laughs> <laughs> so I have nothing to disclose uh, outside of what Dr. Chansky has already said that uh, I matched today, so that added to today's stresses. I actually found out that I matched with one of my best friends from medical school as well as uh, another friend from Alaska. So R2 is a uh, watch out when you guys are chiefs, you'll have, you'll have the dream spine team outside of our current fellows. <clears throat> so this is our uh, outline for today's discussion. We're gonna talk about the pathophysiology of degenerative disc disease and then signs and symptoms of uh, those changes within the cervical spine. We'll talk about the history of the ACDF procedure and how it's evolved over the last few decades, as well as long-term outcomes of the ACDF um, and its complications to include adjacent segment disease and the impetus for the development of disc arthroplasty um, and the current indications. And that will segue into Dr. Zhou's presentation. <clears throat> so why do we choose this topic? I think when we all look uh, back at our experiences, R2s or R4s on the spine service, we think of Harborview combo one, two, or three, the C2s, the T2s, the T10, the pelvises, or some combination of the anterior, posterior procedure. But we do a fair amount of, of elective. Uh, we actually do a quite a bit of elective cases. Uh, we do a lot of ACDFs. Um, as residents, we don't necessarily scrub into those cases. The fellows primarily handle those. But um, we still see patients in clinic who come in with complaints of, of neck pain, radicular pain, myelopathic pain and they could be candidates for a single level fusion versus a disc replacement. So I think as, as physicians, it's our job to be well educated on the topic and be able to present um, a case for one procedure versus the other. So before we, we move on to the procedures, let's talk a little bit about cervical degeneration. <clears throat> We've all heard this term spondylosis, but we may not know exactly what it means. I think it can be considered arthritis in basic terms, um, but instead of a single joint with uh, synovial fluid, the arthritis encompasses uh, in plates, degenerative disc wear, facet joints, uncovertebral joints, uh, a lot of changes in multiple areas instead of just um, uh, the, the basic synovial joint. <clears throat> this occurs in two thirds of the population um, sometime in their life. 54% of the population having symptoms within the last six months. There's even a higher incidence of 
of radiographic degenerative changes, even if the patients are asymptomatic, which we'll talk about in a minute. So let's talk about degenerative cervical degeneration in the setting of myelopathy. So you may have heard the term cervical spondylotic myelopathy or degenerative cervical myelopathy. And this is degeneration of the spine axis and resultant spinal cord compression or nerve root compression. <clears throat> myelopathy in basic terms presents with complaints of hand numbness, weakness, loss of dexterity, gait changes. You'll have long track signs with hyperreflexia, Babinski sign, Hoffman sign. These are all things that we'll see in clinic. <clears throat> and they can worsen in a stepwise fashion, uh, sometimes precipitously. This occurs between uh, in, in five to 60 uh, patients per 100,000. And while that's rare, it actually is the most common cause of uh, non-traumatic spinal cord injury. This can be juxtaposed, uh, excuse me, this is, this is the, um, the flow chart you can think of how degeneration occurs and how, how myelopathy occurs. So you'll see that there's narrowing of the spinal canal, you'll get stretch on the spinal cord, and this can lead to endothelial cell damage, neuroinflammation, and, and changes in the blood-brain barrier. So the myelopathy can be juxtaposed against um, radicular pain. Um, this is more common than myelopathy, occurring in, in three and a half uh, patients per thousand. In generality, this is generally a, um, a dermatomal or myotomal a pain. People describe it as electrical sensation. <clears throat> it can occur in younger patients, primarily occurring uh, due to a herniated disc. If you think back to the patients you've seen in clinic, the younger patients with these symptoms generally have large discs seen on MRI as opposed to older patients who have degenerative changes with large osteophytes that cause the nerve compression. Um, patients can also present with neck pain. Um, generally, we don't consider neck pain in, in and of itself an operative indication, but uh, some, some people can argue that, that it is an operative indication. <clears throat> uh, so axial neck pain should be taken into, consent, into account as well. Uh, radiographic findings of degeneration, though, aren't indication for procedure. You need to have a combination of, of symptoms. Um, one study from uh, 1990 showed that 95% of asymptomatic patients aged 60 to 65 had degenerative changes on their x-rays. And this can be uh, compared to a study from 2005 where 73% of asymptomatic patients, um, you know, of asymptomatic patients, excuse me, 73% had degenerative changes. And then a more recent uh, study of 1,200 patients showed that 87% uh, of asymptomatic patients had disc bulging. <clears throat> so what do we see on x-ray? Uh, patients come in and um, you know, their neck hurts, they have myelopathic symptoms or radicular pain. What do we look for? Well, we'll see facet hypertrophy um, and instability, and we'll look at x-rays here in a second demonstrating those. We'll see spondylolisthesis where one vertebral body slips on the other. Um, on the advanced imaging, we can see disc herniation or bulging, um, and then uh, osteophytes as well. The ligamentous aberrations also occur with hypertrophy of the ligamentum flavum, uh, ossification of the PLL. Um, this is an uh, attempt to stabilize the spine. Uh, some literature shows that, that as, as we age, the, di the discs degenerate. We have desiccation. Uh, the osteophytes uh, form in order to increase surface area adding to the stability of the spine. Unfortunately, these osteophytes can impinge on um, both the, the canal as well as the exiting um, uh, foramina. You can see here on the left, uh, juxtaposed against the right, uh, the left has mild loss of disc height. You have some osteophyte formation indicating early disease. It's a single level. Compared to the image on the right where you see spondylolisthesis, significant osteophyte formation, loss of normal lordosis, and obviously an advanced case. You can look at this uh, CT and MRI also demonstrating similar findings to the radiographs on the left with the MRI showing significant canal compromise and, and um, uh, spinal cord uh, injury or, or myelomalacia. So as we age, our normal lower doses is shown on the left. Uh, the discs preferentially wear anteriorly and what that causes is a, is a loss of the lower doses to a more upright spine. And this is a, a vicious cycle where, where we lose the anterior aspect of the disc, creating more force on the anterior aspect of the disc, uh, thereby leading into a uh, kyphotic deformity. This in turn leads to a narrowing of the, the canal, which can contribute to the, uh, the loss of the sagittal diameter and eventually um, into the myelomalacia. 
So over the last 60 years, ACDF has been accepted as the gold standard treatment for, for degeneration of the cervical spine, and it's the procedure to which, to which arthroplasty is compared for the FDA approval, which Dr. Joe will speak of momentarily. It was originally described by uh, Smith and Robinson in 1958. Um, their study focused on 14 patients, uh, starting the operation in 1954. They used this large longitudinal 8 to 10 centimeter incision that was originally described uh, to explore esophageal diverticuli. They, they used it um, for their procedure after noting that posterior procedures, specifically uh, uh, laminectomy, didn't work well when there was anterior impingement on the spinal cord. There worked, it worked well when there was posterior impingement and maybe even foraminal impingement, but, but didn't work when there was a bulging disc. <clears throat> Additionally, they couldn't treat bilateral symptoms with the, the laminotomy because it would destabilize the facet joints. So people with bilateral symptoms um, didn't have a viable option. So what they did was use the uh, tricortical autograft um, from uh, iliac crest, and they inserted it into the disc space, and then sutured the anterior longitudinal ligament over. Of their 14 patients, uh, nine reported excellent outcomes and four had significant improvement, with the final patient having um, not reporting any improvement, but able to return to work where she couldn't previously. As with any new procedure, there was complications. Two developed a Horner syndrome, two developed paralysis of their spinal, or excuse me, of their vocal cords. One had a postoperative tracheitis, and one had a vertebral artery injury. However, all resolved and there was no long-lasting sequela. Since, since 1958, when the Smith and Robinson approach was described, uh, autograft uh, had been the gold standard. You can see uh, letter A demonstrating the tricortical cancellus that was originally used. And over the ensuing years, different autografts were used. This continued to be the gold standard for quite some time with um, studies showing pseudoarthrosis rates with autograft of less than 3%, 0.9% uh, for autograft. And as, um, as we move forward to allograft, um, the pseudoarthrosis rate increased slightly, to, but still remains less than 3 Today, we use something like we see in the top left with the polyester ester ketone uh, cages that are, that are uh, packed with allograft as well as uh, bone substitute. <clears throat> And then we use um, anterior plates such as these uh, to increase construct stiffness in hopes of decreasing the pseudoarthrosis rate even further. So before we talk about the outcomes, we need to know how we judge how well uh, people do. And so these are, these are three of the main um, patient-reported outcomes or, or disability indexes that are used in the literature. Um, this is a lot of information, but uh, it should be noted that this is on the OED, uh, at least one question every year. So let's look at long-term outcomes of ACDF. Um, this is probably the best study. It's prospective over 10 years, looking at patients who had ACDF at a single or multiple levels uh, for, for three different reasons, whether it was a herniated <laughs> nucleus pulposus, there could have been stenosis, or degenerative uh, disc disease. They looked at visual analog scales to uh, quantify uh, neck and arm pain. They looked at pain medication usage, patient reported satisfaction um, with the procedure at multiple time points, as well as uh, neck disability skills, which we, we just touched on briefly previously. When you look at their arm pain over time, all three uh, cohorts, whether it was a herniated disc, stenosis, or degenerative changes, had improvement with their pain compared to baseline. And this change was seen over the course of um, short term, between 7 to 12 months, upwards of 11 years. Similarly, ACDF has shown great results with reduction of their neck pain. Again, uh, less improvement seen in degenerative disc disease, but this can be seen as a, a potential um, co um, confounding variable as if you have a degenerative spine, you're likely to have pain at, you know, driven at other levels in addition, but it still remains significant. And then this is the patient's subjective pain drawing over time, which also shows improvement. When asked if they considered their treatment to be successful, at uh, 7 to 12 months, 95% considered it successful. And at 9 to 11 years, still 85% considered success. And patients similarly would undergo the treatment again under similar conditions, and they would recommend it to their friend, which I think, think speaks highly of, of the procedure. Of course, with any procedure, there's complications that must be addressed. In this study, over 10 years, um, 
the pseudoarthrosis rate uh, reached approximately 8%, excuse me, um, revision rate reached approximately 8% for non-smokers, 16% for smokers, and this uh, reached its nadir at two years. I think this is important to remember, especially when uh, Dr. Zhou comes up to talk, because we'll touch on numbers similar to that in a moment. So let's talk about adjacent segment disease in the study. Um, I think it's important to remember that this is a, a joint similar to other joints in the body where if we fuse one, we potentially increase the stress and strain on the adjacent joints. <clears throat> so this looks at progression of adjacent segment disease uh, over the cohort over these 10 years. 21% uh, required surgery at the 10-year mark, and if you account for all the patients lost to follow-up, it would be 31% at the 12-year mark. <clears throat> which um, is higher, uh, interestingly, for single level. So patients who had a single level ACDF uh, were more likely to need a fusion on adjacent level compared, uh, that was at 28%, compared to 18% who had previously had a fusion at two levels and 13% who had a fusion at three levels. I think that also speaks to the, the nature of the disease where maybe getting a jump on the adjacent segment degeneration may uh, play a role in preventing future surgery. So this study uh, looked at radicular myelopathic um, segments adjacent to the site of a previous anterior fusion. So uh, this looked um, specifically at the cohort of study over, or cohort of patients uh, across their follow-up, and they showed that uh, approximately 2.9% of patients required, uh, excuse me, developed adjacent segment degeneration per year. And at 10 years, 26% of patients required cervical fusion due to the onset of new uh, symptoms. As I mentioned previously, this is due to adjacent, could be due to adjacent level stressors placed after the fusion. Uh, biomechanical studies have shown that intradisc pressures increase following fusion. There's increased motion at adjacent levels, and there's an increase of up to 20% of shear strain and stress with fusions. This study was a meta-analysis of 83 studies spanning uh, the 1970s through 2010 and follow-up of 12 to 174 months. This is interesting because it shows that adjacent segment disease does, does occur over the course of this varied follow-up, uh, radiographically occurring in 28% of the population, of, of the study population. But that doesn't necessarily correlate with symptoms, and especially doesn't necessarily correlate with the development of uh, symptoms that necessitate a reoperation. So if you look, uh, nearly a, a third had radiographic changes. But when we look back at what we talked about on one of the first slides, how a large portion of the population develops degenerative changes, uh, this could just be natural history. Only 6% required follow-up over the course of that 12 to 174 months. <clears throat> More interestingly was the incidence per year that they, they came up with was radiographically, 2.8% develop uh, radiographic findings of, of adjacent segment disease but less than a quarter of 1% required reoperation per year. So let's talk about total hip arthroplasty for a second. <clears throat> this was the gold standard of treatment for hip arthritis and for de degenerative changes or uh, dysplasia of the hip up until the 1950s. Great pain relief, although it caused um, obvious issues with mobility, but also was noted to have issues with the generation of the spine, the ipsilateral knee and ipsilateral ankle. And I think we can all think to our foot and ankle rotations where we do ankle fusions or subtalar fusions, and the adjacent joints develop arthritis over a set amount of time. Moving forward from this in the 1950s, it was thought, well, if we can invent a, a replacement, a joint that, that could decrease the wear and tear on adjacent level joints, that would be uh, beneficial. And this was a, along the same time when the first um, disc arthroplasty came into being. Um, in the 1960s, uh, Fernstrom uh, developed this right here. As you can see, uh, I couldn't find an image of a cervical implant, but same idea. They were ball bearings sandwiched between the implants of, of vertebral bodies. And as you can imagine, that's a lot of force on very little surface area, and these failed spectacularly. Um, but the, the, the idea was planted in the mind of surgeons. ACDF remained the standard of treatment uh, as described by Smith and Robinson. Uh, again, going through the autograft to allograft to where we are now. <clears throat> in the 1980s, uh, 
there was some success with lumbar uh, disc replacements, making people think, okay, we should go back and look at cervical disc replacement. Maybe this is a viable treatment. In the 80s, they were fraught with treat, uh, treatment errors and failures again. There was screw back outs and there was esophageal injuries. But ultimately, in the, the late 90s, especially in, in Europe, uh, artificial disc actually did have some success. It was originally known as the French A uh, disc, and now it's the Prestige. In 2005, it started its IDE trials with the FDE, excuse me, FDA, and eventually in 2007 was uh, approved. So now we have seven implants that are available for single level, and then two implants that are available for, for two levels. And as you can see from the dates here, they're, they're relatively new, only two dating back uh, before, excuse me, three dating back before 2010. And these are the three that have primarily long-term data. The others are relatively new, and we have short to mid-term data. And here's a picture of, of what they look like. As you can see, the basic design is very similar. There's uh, five that have a high molecular weight polyethylene sandwiched in between two metal, metal implants. And there's a few metal-on-metal -metal prostheses, which have yet to show significant wear debris, unlike the total joint literature. So what's the current indication for arthroplasty? Skeletal mature patients, generally single level disease, so uh, C3 to C7, uh, uh, there's no, nothing above C3 and there's nothing that at the cervical thoracic junction. Patients need to have intractable, radicular, or myelopathic pain due to single level disease localized to the disc space. <clears throat> and they've had to have failed conservative management. I failed to mention when I brought up the original article from Smith and Robinson that they have a very long section describing non-surgical management. Uh, even in the 1950s, surgeons uh, recognized that many patients do better with conservative management and collars, and I think we need to keep that in the back of our mind as we move forward with, with surgical advances. Now, what are the contraindications? These are, these are more interesting. Can't implant in acute or chronic infection similar to the total joints literature. So they're not approved for use in malignancy. You can't have compromised vertebral bodies at the index level, so no fractures, no deformities or disease, so no ankylosing spondylitis, no rheumatoid arthritis. Can't have significant instability, and you cannot have any osteopenia or osteoporosis. T-score uh, less than negative 1.5 is contraindicated. Additionally, uh, no severe uh, facet disease. So that doesn't sound like a patient that we uh, typically see at Harborview, um, but we do actually, and I think it should be worth noting that, that there are some similarities. So if a patient does have central foraminal compression, they may be a candidate for ACDF versus total disc replacement. If they're a single level, potentially a candidate. Multi-level is a bit harder. We, as a tertiary referral center, see more multi-level. Um, so I think it's, it's harder to find a, a patient who has indication at a single level. But as you can see, ACDF has a broad, broad range of, of indications. So uh, spondyloarthropathies, <clears throat> which we see on occasion, um, retrovertebral compression, poor bone quality. We can do them in the setting of infection as well as malignancy. Obviously, ACDF has a great track record. Uh, it's been shown to be a very effective, although there are uh, complications that the risks need to be weighed against the benefits. So, with that, I will segue to Dr. Zhou's component of the uh, presentation. Um, but let's just touch on what we've learned so far. So degenerative changes occur in a large majority of the adult population. Radiographic changes does not equal neck pain, radicular symptoms, or myelopathy. Once a patient fails conservative management, ACDF is the gold standard and has been for decades. Similar to other regions in the body, effusion can increase stress on adjacent levels possibly accelerating the degenerative changes. There's a large study showing that changes occur at less than a quarter percent per year. And this needs to be remembered as we transition to talking about uh, total disc replacement. And in an effort to decrease uh, stress and strain on adjacent levels, total disc has been implement, uh, implemented in, in many practices worldwide. <clears throat> but the indications remain very limited, so. Um, needs to be implemented with, uh, with caution. Here are my references. And thank you. So
Park 2.0 coming September 2018. Thanks, John. Mm. So the reason I, we pick this topic is that we don't really do total disk replacement at Harborville very often. As a new attending, I wanted to learn some new stuff. I wanted to get some evidence before I started doing this kind of surgery. Uh, I knew that there was controversies uh, in the past. I'm hoping that you know, by 2018, we should have better evidence about total disk replacement. Um, I have no disclosures. So like uh, John mentioned, uh, the uh, anterior cervical spinal surgery started in the 1950s. The first ACDF was done in uh, 1954, and the first uh, series was published in 1958. And uh, back in 1959, Scoville already raised question about uh, potential accelerated adjacent level de degeneration. So the point is, we take out the motion at the one level, there's increased uh, stress at the level above and the below. So in my mind, there are three components to the adjacent level degeneration. There's part is uh, natural history. They got one bad disc. There's a chance they have second disc going, you know, have de degeneration and causing symptoms. And of course, there's fusion effect. If the patient had a fusion at the one level, we take out the motion at that level, the level above and the below, potentially could have more stress. That has been demonstrated in the lab but uh, how that can translate into the real world, we don't really quite understand. And in my mind, there is an uh, aerotrogenic air component into this as well. I'll show some x-rays next. So this is a 37-year-old uh, female came to Harborville last year with the C5-6 uh, and the C5-6 and the C6-7 uh, degenerative, degenerative disc. She had the symptoms at the C6 level. MRI showed the C5-6 disc herniation with a nerve root impingement. But she had another x-ray back in 2013. Back then, she had only one bad disc. So the second disc got uh, degeneration from purely uh, natural history. This has nothing to do with uh, the Jason level problems. And uh, of course, for this patient, had uh, an instrumented fusion. Uh, had two level uh, motion got taken out, then there's increased uh, stress at the level above and the below. Potentially that can accelerate the degeneration. And uh, when we do a discectomy and the fusion, we uh, get the exposure done, we take out the disc, we put in the graft either six or seven millimeters. Rarely we put in a eight millimeter graft, and then we put a sm the plate to bridge it. Uh, normally I use a 14 plate for six or seven millimeter graft. Rarely we use a 16. And uh, this patient came to Harborville last year. She had a surgery done about a year ago and uh, had a single level ACDF for a cervical radiculopathy. Six months later, she started having malopathic symptoms. She had dexterity problems, balance problems. And on the flexion extension, actually, within six months, she got osteophyte and 11 degrees of motion at the level above. So we uh, took out the old plate, we did discectomy, and fused her one level above. In my mind, this is not a um, accelerated degeneration from the level below. To me, we took out the plate, which was 28 millimeters. So in my mind, this plate is too long. It's violating the end plate and the disc above, causing all these problems. So when we uh, consider alternative to the ACDF, uh, the main goal is to have something equivalent in the outcome of the ACDF. The implants should last for a long time. The main reason is to reduce the incidence of the adjacent level disease. We all need to know that we cannot change the natural history. That means there will be patients coming back for the adjacent level problems secondary to natural history. But we need to see whether the total disc, can re, uh, total disc replacement can decrease the um, adjacent level 
problem secondary to fusion or to the damage to the next level. So for uh, getting FDA approval for a total disk um, device, they require ID study, which is a um, investigational device exemption study, basically to compare the new device to current standard of care, which is ACDF. They require multi-center prospective controlled study and it needs to prove that the new uh, trial should uh, be not inferior to the comparator, which is ACDF. So the definition of success overall is about to have improved NDI score and uh, no device failure, uh, requiring subsequent surgical intervention and uh, no major complications, uh, which is defined as uh, worsening of neurological symptoms, significant adverse events. This is defined by the research committee. So this is varies from, from one project to another project. And uh, for TDR group, if they got a fusion, that is a complication. For ACDF group, if they uh, did not get a fusion, got pseudoarthrosis, that's also a complication. So they compare the success rate between the uh, total disk replacement versus uh, ACDF if the new device is not worse than the comparator to a uh, significant margin, they call it non-inferiority, then they can get approved. And uh, there are three types of uh, study design, inferiority, superiority, and the equivalency. Normally they don't do equivalency tests. So if the new device is better than the uh, comparator and the zero is not included in the 95% confidence interval, they can claim this is superior. So when I look at the two-year data, there are seven uh, implants in the market at this point. So there are seven studies. So when we look at NDI score, there's one uh, implants is better than the ACDF. When we look at the neurologic success rate, there's two implants are better than the uh, ACDF group. When we look at the secondary surgery, this is the main goal to have the uh, total disc replacement. Actually, there are three implants are better than the comparator. So I got excited a little bit. Then I started reading all the three papers. This one uh, was published the latest in the uh, 2013 regarding secure C disk. So they had 89 non randomized into the total disk replacement group, 140 into the AC, randomized into the ACDF group, and 151 randomized into the TDR group. And uh, there was no difference regarding secondary surgery at adjacent level. The second surgery at the index level is more common in the ACDF group, which in that study was 9.7% in two years, comparing to the TDR group only about 2.5%. Then the second paper was regarding ProDisc C published in 2009. Again, there was no difference in adjacent level surgeries and the 1.8% TDR group had the secondary surgery in two years compared to 8.5% in the AD ACDF group. Then the earliest study was published in 2007 regarding Prestige ST uh, implants. They had about 270 patients in each arm. This is the only study showing difference in the adjacent level secondary surgery between TDR group versus ACDF group. So regarding the index uh, level secondary surgery, the difference was still significant, 1.8 versus 8.7. So in summary, for two-year data, single level ACDF versus TDR, the TDR group, there's one implant showing uh, less adjacent level surgery and uh, there's one paper showing better NDI score in the CDR group. There's two implants showing better neurological recovery, and they claim the success in four out of the uh, seven showing they are better than the ACDF group. 
When we look at the secondary surgery, this is really more about the index level, not really about the adjacent level. At the index level, three papers showed roughly 8 to 10 percent uh, secondary surgery at the index level comparing to around 2 percent in the TDR group. At this point, I have a question. Is ACDF really as reliable as we thought? Then I started literature research, came, found that this paper came out of Rush. So they retrospectively look at 159 patients had ACDF. Those are patients had the single level, two level, and the three level ACDFs. 48 patients had only one level. They followed the patients for two years. So potentially those 48 patients can get enrolled into the IDE study. And they found only one patient among those 48 had secondary surgery, which was for adjacent level problems. And there was no revision surgery at the index level. So this is 0% versus somewhere between 8 and 10% in the IDE study. Again, in this group, total 159 patients at two years. The patients either had one, somewhere between one to three level ACDF at two years. There roughly was about 4% had secondary surgery, and the majority of them, 3%, were for adjacent level problems. And at the three and a half years follow up, there was roughly 7% secondary surgeries. Again, 5.7% were for adjacent level problems. And this is a meta-analysis for all the prost uh, prospective studies showing that there's no difference in the rate of uh, adjacent level disease comparing ACDF versus total disc replacement. So maybe two years is too short to notice the difference and we need to look at long-term data. So recently there are five papers published, uh, seven year follow up for those IDE studies. Uh, for single level, there are three papers. The first one was regarding uh, Prestige LP. They showed the secondary surgery at the adjacent level was 9.6% versus 8.3%, no difference. The other two studies regarding Prodix C and the MOBC showed there's more secondary surgery in the adjacent level comparing to the ACDF. So we started showing, we started seeing some difference in between the two groups. And for two levels, there are only two implants are um, approved by FDA for two level use. And uh, among those two papers, uh, seven year data, there's no difference in one paper, there's some difference in the other paper. And this paper is from Indiana. They are uh, following the uh, uh, ID study for Bryant disc. So they covered the surgery part follow up after seven years. They look at the uh, cephalid level by radiographic criteria for degeneration. They try to compare which uh, surgery had more degeneration in the cephalid level they came up with the conclusion that there's no difference. And uh, this is a outside US paper, um, came out of a na national registry from Sweden, total about 715 patients for five year follow up with 94% follow up rate. So in this group, 504 patients had ACDF somewhere between one level to three levels and 172 patients had the TDR. Look, by looking at the adjacent level disease secondary surgery, there were 26 in the ACDF group, which was about 5%, and the seven in the TDR group, which was about 4%. So the p-value was 0 0.4, there was no difference. But there was more secondary surgery in the TDR group regarding index level secondary to migration osteolysis. So basically, this paper showing increased secondary surgery in the TDR group, which is opposite from the conclusion from our IDE studies. So in summary, the TDR is an alternative treatment 
uh, to ACDF, there's really not much data saying it is worse than ACDF. And I think at this point, the controversy still exists. So the long-term data starts showing some possible reduced adjacent level surgeries, but they are not really consistent. And the TDR is related with less secondary uh, surgery at index level, but there's a huge discrepancy between the ID studies versus retrospective studies. Thank you. Thank you both for, uh, for that presentation. Anybody have any questions they want to ask before I, I start asking? Carlo? Carlo's our big uh, arthroplasty king, so we'll see what he has to say. <laughs> so you, I guess what you didn't tell us, you started to talk, first of all, it was a fantastic talk. I think it was a great review of the, of the data that we have available. Um, you started out by saying, that one of your goals was to really try to look into whether this is something you want to pursue. You didn't really give us an answer at the end. Um, so what did you, what was your kind of your conclusion and how do you potentially explain the discrepancy between the failure at the index level, failure rate at the index level, reoperation rate at the index level in the, uh, in the IDE studies versus the other studies? I feel like there's some discrepancy in the decision making by taking the patient back to surgery in those ID studies versus in the real world. So I'm still, I feel like I'm more confused by the end. <laughs> one, one quick follow-up. One quick follow-up to that. So a, a slightly different version to pin you down maybe uh, of the last question. If you had single level uh, C5, C6, uh, spondyloarthritis, and you had bad, uh, you know, uh, foraminal symptoms. Would you? And you were young. Say you were 45 years old or so, uh, like you are. Would you consider uh, a disc replacement, or would you have an ACDF? Uh, I think I'm leaning more towards the ACDF at this point. Can you, can you extrapolate why? Uh, just. Uh, I mean, the, the data on the ID studies, uh, I mean, I feel like they put credibility problems to their own data. I don't know there's something, some bias into it. We don't really know the, the equation in, that, in those studies. What about Dr. Jack Wilson? It's a hard question. I, at, at, at 35, I would I'd probably go with the disc because you can always fuse. Start with an artificial disc. Realizing that you may have problems down the road, but deal with that issue when it comes along. Wally? Um, I noticed a really big discrepancy between reoperation rates in the historical data with ACDF, um, with a, most of those were graft alone, um, versus the IDE studies is like one or two percent uh, versus versus ten percent. And I assume in the ID study they were plated and allographed or, or something. So I'd like one of you to comment on why you think there's such a difference between historical data and ID data on reoperation after ACDF. It's interesting. That, that's something that we've discussed and thought about. Um, the literature shows that that autograft actually has a higher fusion rate. So I think, think some of that is the IDE studies were allograft, which will raise um, the fusion rate. But as far as why it's, the, the IDE studies have twice or, or double the, the revision rate that, that non-IDE studies have, I, I, can't, I can't rectify that finding. Yeah, no, I, I don't have a good answer for that either. I'm wondering if a total hips and knee, of course, designs has evolved over the years. Do you see any difference between newer design of this disc implant compared to older design of the disc implant? So from, 
when the FDA made its first approval in 2007 to its most recent, only I think seven years later, there hasn't been a lot of, of variation or change. It's basically Ford, Chevy, Toyota, very similar. Um, I think all of them share similarities that you know, our cervical spine has 100 million cycles in our lifetime. Um, and so depending on when you put it in, you could have tens of millions of cycles. So you know, it can only be thought of that, that down the road, 15, 20, 30 years, if these discs are in place, you'll get, you'll get wear debris. You could potentially wear out your polyethylene. Um, I think these are you know, issues that will probably have design changes in the future, but right now I think it's too short term to necessitate those changes or to, to cause those changes to happen. I thought this was a uh, really honest presentation of a real controversy, and uh, I congratulate both of you. I, uh, I've had an opportunity to see a lot of the European operated patients in our clinic. Somehow that's uh, the University of Washington has been referred many of those patients. We have reported on a case that uh, where we got into the <clears throat> polyethylene uh, debris problem and it decayed the whole bone. It would look like a rampant infection. So it's much of the total hip world has come to the, knee, to the neck now. The second is we've seen cases where two levels have been done, but the patient still has a lot of neck pain and they have facet disease posteriorly. So now you're moving painful joints and that doesn't seem to be a great solution for the neck pain. And I think uh, the other is that probably 50% of us are going to have degenerative changes in our neck at two levels by the time we're 50. And if you use that kind of thinking and look at the MRIs really carefully, the disease was already there on a carefully looked at MRI. So to blame the fusion or to blame the prosthesis on the degenerative disease that's adjacent when it's already recorded on the MRI, I think is a little faulty in our thinking. There's a lot of natural history for the JCNFO problem. So the studies really, for TDR studies, really to see um, whether the fusion makes a difference on the, the JCNFO problem, and uh, doing a TDR versus ACDF, will that make any difference? That's number one question. Number two is that difference, whether we can catch by our research. So, so there are so many <clears throat> moving parts into this thing, so we don't really at this point, I don't think we have really good evidence to support either way. Chris, well, maybe you could uh, step up to the microphone if you, if you don't mind. And you, one of those articles was your article. You know, do you have any comments on this? And I guess you know, the same sort of scenario presented to, uh, to John and Hightow here. If, if you had a single level, um, degenerative level, you know, maybe some moderate arthrosis, the adjacent levels, what would you want? But, uh, I have a similar confusion to Hightow. I don't know what the right answer is. And I hear some spine surgeon saying that there's good data to support uh, an arthroplasty. And I just find that there's that discrepancy, even if the seven year data, the IDE studies just don't match up with the retrospective studies. And I, I'm leaning a little bit towards the way Jonathan has described it. If you're 30 or 40, year old, 40 years old and you can't have a foraminotomy, maybe a disc replacement is better because you have 30 or 40 years to go. Um, and it's a single level disease. But beyond that, I think I still favor ACDF um, because it's still like the gold standard. I think it's a hard, it's a hard surgery to beat. So that's, that's where I sit. Okay. Chris, maybe while you're at the microphone still. So when patients come in and say, you know, that they want something, they want an artificial disc, how do you, what is sort of the, the, the line of thinking you give them? I, I haven't had a lot of patients come to me. I think if a young person in the 30s or 40s came to me with a soft disc herniation, failed all conservative treatment, and they really wanted a single level artificial disc, I think it'd be reasonable. I'd probably give them all the data that I have, show them both options. Um, I've had one or two patients that have come in asking for that, and I've actually referred them to somebody else because I haven't done one in practice yet. But I think it's reasonable for that younger group of patients but I think you, you would probably have to tell the patients, listen, this isn't proven to be better than an ACDF. I, 
you've implanted a few, haven't you, or at least a handful? <laughs> You're the only one who's done some. <laughs> yes, I have. So. Do you know anything, since you haven't, I don't think any of you have done these, do you know anything about the reimbursement for this procedure? Is it is it comparable to an ACDF, or is it uh, jackpot if you do uh, disc replacements? So um, I've actually done a number of artificial discs in, in the cervical spine, not a, not a huge number, but a, a, a handful. Um, in reality, actually, the CPT coating, by the time you break it down, is actually it's, it's less reimbursement from a surgical standpoint in this country. It's actually different in Canada. It's actually high, high, more highly reimbursed in Canada. But with the way the CPT codes, it's one code, as opposed to if you do an ACDF, we can bill for the, the, the discectomy and inner body fusion plus a plate. So if you're really in it from an individual standpoint, it's better to do an ACDF than it's to do an artificial disc. Are, they, are the implants expensive? Um, I don't know what they are billed. Um, I had one patient who, paid, who was willing to pay cash and the hospital told them that the implant itself would cost $6,000 um, just for the implant, which... Similar to a total joint, uh, if paying if out of so. pocket. And so, Rick, since you've done these, what is your opinion uh, on the controversy as to what their indications are, if any? I think one of the big barriers that uh, is an issue these days is insurance status. And a lot of insurance still consider it experimental and they're not willing to reimburse. And I think that's a big factor in sort of getting people authorized and getting them approved to have these, these done. Um, you know, I kind of, I have a number of people who have come to me and said, I, I really insist on having an artificial disc and I've done my own research and I try and, <clears throat> you know, everything that John and Hightow mentioned, you know, try and walk through that scenario. And it's usually about a half hour conversation about the pros and cons of it. Um, and really, I tell them when, when push comes to shove, I don't see a big difference between the two in terms of outcome. And I'm kind of, I'm happy to go either route, just assuming that their insurance will reimburse for it and they're not suddenly stuck paying out of pocket. But uh, I can think of one patient I had, I did an artificial disc on, who came back and had some loosening around the prosthesis. Um, but I, ha I didn't have any revisions of any of my artificial discs. And best I know, and I don't have 10-year follow-up, um, you know, they're all pretty happy and had good outcomes. But, you know, the same thing is true for ACDFs. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, uh, both of you, for a nice review.